This is, this is, this is. Oh, on the 30th, I'm doing a show with uh, Victoria Jackson from Saturday Night Live. Do you remember her? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, she lives here in Tennessee. So Right on, right on. Yeah, I bought – well, I could, talk, I, could, I could talk about on podcasts how I had her on my show. And that's other – We should if we can talk about that too because I wouldn't have started a podcast unless you urged me to do one, so – that's right. That's right. Let's yeah, we're we're going. Let's let's uh let's just get into it. My guest okay. is Lee Lee Harden, comedian, hey. <laughs> uh, musician, but but mainly comedian, right? You're a yeah yeah you're a damn good guitar player though. I've seen your videos. Oh my gosh! All right, well the podcast can end now. That's that's all I needed to hear. Uh, <laughs> well, of course, that's amazing. Coming from you, that means a lot. I mean, not to sound too sappy, but. You guys were the reasons I I played a guitar and, and played it often, so uh, that, that that's really cool. I, I appreciate that. That's so, cool. Yeah, yeah, it sounds but, sounds like you you probably started young and played throughout your teens, and um, and now you're into comedy. So it's a mm-hmm. whole new journey. It's a whole new learning experience. And how long you been doing comedy now? I think it's I think I'm at the ten year mark. I think I started uh, 2014. I think so I'm pretty sure I'm at that 10 year mark. I did my first open mic at the East Room in Nashville, Tennessee, and that open mic is uh, still going on. But I remember being so terrified and angry at the same time because it was right when I was about to go up. Um, you may have heard of him, uh, a guy named Nate Bargatze, uh popped oh, yeah. in to do a, a guest set, and uh, he was a, he was a well respected name then, and obviously he's doing arenas and hosting SNL, hosting SNL now, but. I remember like going, man, Nate's Nate's taking my time, <laughs> like <laughs> so. Oh, uh, he took your but, he took your time slot. Well, he he he. So if like you're a well established comedian and you show up at an open mic, if if they're like, hey, can I just hop in and do five minutes? They're gonna let you, as they should. You've earned it. So I was so young and naive, but yeah, I, I, the spot I was about to go in, he took it, and then I had to go like right after, after him. Yeah, so That's- he didn't like take my spot, but I was like. It was. I was amped up. I was ready to walk up those steps, and then, yeah. hey, we have a guest, Nate Bargatze. I'm like, oh shoot! So I had to get my mind right and all that stuff. So, yeah, but yeah, that, that was that was uh, that was ten years ago. That's part of it. And, and having those experiences teaches you just more about life. I mean, it's it's expectations are so hard to to overcome when they don't go your way. And that goes for anybody. So comedian, musician, artist, somebody that's, they didn't wash the dishes right. I don't know, whatever it is, right? <laughs> so that's a, that's a huge learning experience early on, seeing somebody like Nate Burgett. You're, you're going to be like, okay, if I'm lucky, I, that keeps happening to me. Because yeah. that means you're around greatness. You're around the best in the business and, and, and wanting to be, wanting to be like part of that energy, you know? But I, I understand completely what you mean by being green, not understanding the situation, not fully comprehending what is happening in the moment, and then sort of thinking about it later, going, wow, uh, I, I realized why I was kind of bummed that, that my I didn't get the spot or whatever, but like, now I get it. It's just part, mm-hmm. of, it's just part of the business, and, and, and uh Things don't, yeah. You just got to roll with the punches, right? You got to be prepared. That's that's something that I feel like I'm in and out of as an artist. But when I'm at my best, mm-hmm. I am prepared to write a song. I'm prepared to play a show. I'm prepared to do a you know acoustic set. You know, they're, they're all different forms of the art, and, and mm-hmm. um, that to me is you know comedy kind of has similar. There's stand up comedy. There's um, video comedy i think you know social media comedy which could have stand up in it but there is an art mm-hmm. form to what the the videos people put out um oh absolutely yeah. so yeah there's there's different fortes and for me you know i'm not necessarily always on all uh firing on all cylinders right right i'm like focused on this and so i'm not going to be good at this other thing um i wonder if that if you found any of those to be your favorite part of comedy or, or is there any, any niche of that, that, that you found that I didn't even mention? Yeah. I mean, finding out what you love. I don't know. I feel like it's that, uh, 
that iceberg thing. There's 10% of what people see, but there's that 90% of what they don't see, the underbelly, all the workings. And I learned this last year that although I, although I had to be my own agent, I had to be my own promoter, it came out of necessity. I, I don't like doing those things. I don't think I'm that great at doing those things, but I, I've had to be that out of out of necessity. So, because the first few shows I was doing last year with this new adventure I got into, I'm like, at the show, day of show, I'm like, oh shoot, I got to be funny. I forgot all about that. Uh, I I was so business minded. Like, how many tickets were sold? How many is the other comedian here? Um, have I said hello to everyone at the venue? Because I really pride myself on um, on being professional and making sure everyone knows that I'm grateful they're there. Because a lot of these places are volunteer ran, so I'm just all of that was in my head, even while on stage. And I guess it's, it's a sign that you're a pro. Because afterwards, I would be asking like friends of mine that were on the show or that came. I'm like, did I seem off? Because I I didn't really feel like I was there. And they're like. No, we couldn't tell at all. Like, and they were being honest. So I'm like, all right, that means there's growth. So, but the rhythm I got into, I just realized, okay, I like the 45 minutes to an hour of performing when you can step into your stuff. That part is fantastic. Saying hi to people after the show, because uh, I do that. I leave the stage early. I always try to say bye to everybody on the way out. It means a lot that they bought a ticket. So, saying hi to people after the show and, uh, yeah, just the actual performance part and uh, doing your own thing. That that part's great. The uh, the stuff I, I, I it's not fun, but it's got to get done. Is that booking, that promoting, and uh, so yeah. So if that, ho- I hope that makes sense. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, a, a lot of people we work with um, have a hard time going from artwork to numbers and back to artwork like they can't switch (laughs) and and i can't either necessarily when it comes to that but i am i'm a little different because um i guess i'm not that different now that i'm thinking about it because it's it it is just like whatever you're thinking a a lot about that's what you're going to kind of excel in um Mm -hmm. even if you're not good at it you're going to get better at it so there there will be growth I, i that's what i've kind of found for myself um it it's constantly changing though like what i think i'm like i'm like well i'm not really like that anymore now that i think about it. you know like things like that which is weird but um do you so when you're doing you're doing long sets now like 45 to an hour th- those are headlining sets headlining sets and uh again it came out of necessity i because i would do headlining sets on these uh i called them development gigs it was me trying to get stage time wherever I could, and there's bookers all around the country that send out emails like, hey, I need a comedian that can do this. It pays 200 bucks, and if you're starting out, that's a ton of money. So I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Can you do an hour? I'm like, absolutely, and I totally couldn't do an hour. But I was like, okay, it's an HVAC company that needs a comedian, and – they're going to forget I was there. I'm going to forget I was there a few years down the road. <laughs> so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. I will, I, I even, to, start, to add to time, I even brought a guitar. I was trying to do like jazz chords and, and one liners over it just to, just to extend that time to see if I could do that hour. Um, and it's daunting to go through all of your jokes like, man, this is not going to add up to an hour. I don't, I don't know about this. But, I would do those type of gigs, but in real shows like clubs or things that you saw me at in Waco, those are a little different. That's that's more of an experience of we're going to a comedy show, not oh company Christmas party crap. We got to sit through a, a comedian that's not famous. Awesome. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a difference between the two. So uh, so yeah, this uh, you know I've been doing it long enough to where I could do those long sets, but uh, yeah, this past year when I'm booking them. I'm, I'm headlining sets. Okay. Yeah. Do you uh, yeah. elongate some of those bits? Do you like add chunks to them? To, yeah. I like okay. I this is promising, yeah. but I need to develop this better. I need to like have a, a stronger punchline. I need to have multiple punchlines. And I, I, do you do that as well? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Um, even even jokes that were on that special I first did in 2019 with Drybar. I go back and go. You know, I could I could add more to this. Who cares? I'm gonna I'm gonna open that hood. I'm gonna 
add, I'm going to tweak this engine a little bit and, you know, see if I can get, you know, some more fun out of this. And yeah. then jokes you're excited about, those are fun. Because the more you do this, you start sounding more natural with tags. They don't sound so jokey. But, yeah, just like a new joke yeah. how I just uh, had about uh, going to Aldi or how people – love shopping at Aldi and how they tell me how much I can save at Aldi. And the joke is they're not kidding about how much you can save. Like I just bought a shopping cart for a quarter. So uh, yes, if you that's know, the joke. Al- but you got to know Aldi, you know, you got to know Aldi and that, that, so that do you set it up more? Do you like go back and go, okay, I need to set it up more so that it's funny for more people. What I do for that one before I do, before the show starts, I Google maps really quick. All right. Where's the nearest Aldi? Aldi? <laughs> you yeah. really? Okay. That, that, I mean, <laughs> sure. But that seems like a, a strategy that's only going to be really able to work a few times, right? Like oh, after a yeah, while, you're going to be like, oh, I got to look up Aldi again. Like, oh, all yeah, right, I'm in this new city. Like, <laughs> And then what do you do if they don't have an Aldi? Do you just not oh. do the joke? Do you? Like, oh, well, yeah, you'll skip it. Um, but I don't know. It's got to be like, a way to like do all any joke you know, and make it funny. Right. Like, and just like mostly, set it up. Right. And so that it's like, Oh my God, I don't know. Yeah. Easier said yeah, than no, done. I, I want to know as a, as a comedian. Cause like as a, as a musician, there's different types of musicians, just like there's different types of comedians. Right. But yeah. some are more rehearsed. Some are more like they're in between lines are exactly the same all the time. Me. I've always been like, I have a general theme of what I want to say. And that's about it. And, and I might end up saying it similar a few times, but it's never going to be the same. It's not like a rehearsed mm-hmm. line, but, sure. but there's nothing wrong with rehearsal. Like if you're playing in an arena, do you want to have, you know, Chicago get a, a way worse show than Denver, you know, or whatever. Right. right. Like <laughs> yeah. just accidentally because the person happened to just make some crazy, you know, but at the same time, it's like, that's live. That's a live show. Yeah, have you have you ever said the name of the wrong town on, on tour? I probably have. I probably okay. Have. Yes, <laughs> I mean, nothing as catastrophic as uh, as as some others that we've seen. But I, I, I'm thinking about like the Simpsons joke. Uh, oh, no one town. rocks like looks at the back of their guitar. <laughs> Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm kind of a Simpsons nerd, so if you if you Whatever. if you say remember that episode, I'll be like, yes, I can. Is it you know. Springfield? Is it not Cleveland? Sorry, I, I there's Springfield, Cleveland. but Spinal Tap. What happened in the movie Spinal Tap was they were, they were backstage. <laughs> they were they were like, "Hello, Cleveland." They were getting ready for the "Hello, Cleveland," <laughs> and they yes. run into that janitor like, "Oh man, you 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 got to take a jog up there." Like we haven't time for a jog. And <laughs> I love that. Like they get stuck. <laughs> is that the same part where they get stuck behind, like finding the stage and they're like, where's yeah. the stage? They can't find and they it. See, like, yeah. And they see the janitor again, man, you just got, you came back to where you started. Like <laughs> that is a classic movie. I love that movie. Do you relate to movies? Do you relate to that movie? The more you do what you do, do you go, Oh gosh, yes, that was, or is that at all? Well, Does it connect with we you? We always related to that movie because we saw okay. it and we were, you know, mid mid career and and you know dealing with record label uh, reps and and they're all nice and stuff. But like you you know the type of record label execs and and the the, the BS smoke they throw up and oh yeah. and, and it's just like that world, right? Like everybody's got something to sell you. Everybody's gonna like, hey, every, you know, you're gonna be a star. So yeah, did they get so, the? Po- did they have? The, it was the '90s. Did they have the ponytail, the pulled back ponytail <laughs> and suit? <laughs> Somebody probably did. I can't remember. Oh, okay. No, no, not not <laughs> like, the guy that I'm thinking of. But like Mr. Big in Wayne's World. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we never yeah. had anybody. I mean, we. I'm trying to think. Was the Sony guy? No, 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 no. Uh, Donnie Einer. He was uh, the the Sony exec we met with, and he was like, "Do you need us to take care of this guy, Brandon, for you? You know, from Tooth and Nail Records." Oh, uh, <laughs> allegedly he said that. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. So he didn't have and- a ponytail, but he probably should have. <laughs> So depending on the time frame, you were like, well, do we want to take Brandon out? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do, but no. Dude, no, no. <laughs> don't do it. Please don't do that. Please, no. At the, t- at the time, at the time. But uh, right. time heals most wounds. 100%, man. That's, my gosh, I love 
that phrase that phrase is one of my most favorite phrases and it, it holds it holds true like as you go oh i was so angry about that moment a few years mm-hmm. ago and i'm not as heartbroken over it now so so when you do your your sets uh do you do crowd work is that built into your time is it- some i i don't know I, the older the longer i do this when i first started like those road gigs where i had to stall time yes cuz i'm like all right this this is development time this is minor league system this is uh single a baseball where like okay you can you can learn here like this is a small event this isn't a real club it's not on tv you can you can have room to express and explore and all that stuff so i would do crowd work i've gotten away from it just you know comedy is your joke should be enough that's how i feel i guess i'm more old school now the trend is crowd work those are the videos that take off on yeah. facebook is crowd work and if you can do that, that's awesome. If that's your thing, it doesn't always go good. Like I, I've asked a couple in the front row once how they met, and the lady said, "Oh, we met through my ex-husband." Yeah, and I, which is I was trying perf- to be, yeah, <laughs> oh, it yeah is I was, I was trying to be funny, and I'm like, I, I was trying to be like Jerry Springer and go, "Well, hey, we actually have your ex-husband behind the stage. Come on out," you know. And she's like, "That's not possible. He's dead." Oh so, my God! All right, and I was—I was like, I'm so sorry. He died of a drug overdose. I'm like, stop talking. <laughs> yeah, and you don't know how to recover from something like that. How do you? Right. Thank. Thankfully, I was like, guys, this is not the worst situation I've been in, and the crowd laughs. Then I talk about the story of how I had to do comedy on a farm for prisoners, and so which was it was risky because that's usually how I was I was closing sets at the time, but I'm like. All right, got to think something else because I, I need to. There's not many people here, but I need to dig myself out of this hole so we can walk away happy. Yeah. So like you've pulled yourself out of bombing. You like you were like, okay, this is I'm bombing. I'm gonna lose the crowd for the rest of the show. Yeah. If I don't do something to pull them back out. Yeah. That's probably yeah, one you, of the hardest things to do, right? Oh yeah, because you when you when you bomb you you sweat it, it the the heat gets. I don't know. They they don't turn on they don't turn up the heat in the room, but it, it feels like it, it feels like the just physically the you're like in, enveloped in like hot yeah. Air you just and, you feel and like sweating. you sunk, you feel like your the audience is up here and you're down here is how you feel like right yeah oh it's, my gosh and it's um I've, I've the, only, the only really horrible one and it was like famously bad because I had other comedians reaching out like, oh, heard you were at the Stardome last night. And I'm like, oh, crap. It got it got out. That <laughs> yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's like state, uh, rest of development. Like, you know, Michael Jr. Like, oh, I heard about the A minus, you know. It's yeah. Like, what, what was the, so, what was the Stardome? Where's it's that? In at? Birmi- Birmingham. It's in Birmingham, Alabama. And it's a, it's a really cool setup. It's, it's, uh, it's just really nice, big room. And, uh, I, I, I thought this was right after Waco we hung out right after dry bar came out and uh, I was doing two nights and I thought I was doing their smaller room cause they have a smaller room and I'm like, cool, this will be great. Relaxed. I found out I was in the giant main room and I'm like, Oh, I don't just, it was intimidating. And the room was papered, which means in comedy papered room means the tickets were basically free. They're just paying for food. Is essentially what that means, and I, I'll, I wasn't the typical comedian that shows up on a Wednesday Thursday night. I'll say that, and uh, you know, I was. I'm not going to say no to opportunities like that. I had comedians telling me I shouldn't have done that, but I'm like, tell me when you said no to a opportunity. Like, I'll be okay. And uh, so that's what I did. I, I, it, it was, I did my 45. It was a long 45. And uh, even the next day for the next show, the sound guy came in and he just hung his head low. He's like, man, they, man, they were mean to you. I'm so sorry about that. He was like, I, and I didn't really attack the crowd that much either. I just did my thing. And uh, as I was going, the crowd got louder with table talk. So I was just, I was just background. It was, it was a long 45 minutes and just talking while people were talking. And yeah, it was bad enough where I didn't even get to headline the next day. I remember that it was, uh, they put me in the middle of my own show. He added like five more comics. He made it, a, he made it a showcase night 
And I, my face is on the poster, but I was in the middle of the lineup, like doing 10 minutes. So basically getting fired without getting fired. And, uh, yeah, I always, I always, I always joke about, I quit every year. That was definitely a, that was definitely that moment. I was ready to be done with it. Yeah. That's probably what gets a lot of, a lot of people that are doing, you know, performing arts, you know, you're failing in public. That's hard. That's hard. It's vulnerable. That's it's very, vulnerable. very hard. I feel for you just hearing that, man. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh that, feels, that feels bad, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, go keep going. I mean. Oh, I was just, uh, yeah, because early on I would, I would have, I would definitely have internal meltdowns on, on those nights because, again, so new. And I was still, I was maybe five years in, so. And a lot of people I looked up to were telling me I was too new to be doing that. And that, that kind of hurt where I was like, I was just venting. I didn't really ask where you thought I was in comedy. So I had a, I had a lot of mentors I looked up to just kind of be too honest and maybe I had it coming. But that I remember that, that was that was definitely a letdown, like some people I learned from kind of saying – because maybe you dealt with this. There's perm- I think in comedy there's permanent association how people first see you that have been doing it for a long time or been around it a long time. That's kind of how they're always going to see you. So no, no matter how much you grow and get better at it, they'll always see you as that, you know, kind of like a mom sees their 21 year old as an infant. They just see them that way no matter what. Yeah. That's been your experience with some of those guys. That's, that's hard too, but what do you do from there? Do you, do you pivot? Well, it just, uh, you just move on. You go, you know what? I uh, These people don't pay to see you do comedy. And uh, one day maybe they'll change their mind. And some did. Some did watch the special and was like – people I never thought would say, hey, you're good at this. Would go, hey, I watched it. You crushed it. So, yeah, it's that Michael Jordan thing. Like prove them wrong. Like you didn't yeah. make the basketball team. Okay, find a way to prove them wrong. Make it undeniable that you're you're good at what you do. And so, yeah, I really don't worry about too much of, of, of too many about I don't worry about too many other comedians. I just worry about the people that want to come see a live comedy show and I want to make it a good time for them. That's that's really windshield mentality is what they say. Just focus on what's ahead of you mm-hmm. and, you know, worry about the people that paid to see you because it means a lot to the, them to have a night out. And it means a lot to the to me, the comedians who get to perform for people and I, I love that these people are buying tickets for a guy that they don't really know that well yet. Yeah. I, I, that's yeah. a great, that's a healthy attitude. I think, you know, um, how do you write your jokes? Uh, when I first started, it was, I was fresh out of a comedy class. So I was uh, just doing one liners from my comedy homework and they didn't, they were clever, but they didn't really make a lot of sense. So what's, an, open an, what's, what's an example of one of your first jokes you think? Um, let's see. I talked about, it was a, it was a joke exercise. I think it was, it was family reunions. And cause you had to start off saying, I love this thing and then make a quick joke about why you love it. And I applied the rule of threes, which is like that third line has got to be the funniest thing. And I think I said something like, I love family reunions, the, the food, the fellowship, the what t-shirt contest, you know? Yes. Yeah, and if so you're in was, Tennessee, it makes sense. Or or right. Alabama or yeah. yeah, I used the Tennessee line actually for uh, an online dating joke. How I Tinder, Bumble, Ancestry dot com. People laugh at that. And I've been adding. If I'm out of Tennessee, I add like I'm saying what the crowd's saying. I'm like, well, he is from Tennessee. That makes sense. So yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but you know, that was the but that the what that family that was just a quick quick joke that. I'm going to try this in a mic and if they know, if they know it's your first time, they're going to be pretty generous to you too. So after a while, the cleverness kind of wears off and it's like, all right, let's be more sincere, you know, yeah. try to try, try to be genuine up there. Still working on that. But what style com- comedy do you think you do? I, I was, I was wanting to be Gaffigan when I first started. I was, that dude is my hero. What style um, is that you think? I mean, I know Gaffigan, Jim Gaffigan of course, but sure. Um, you know, self-deprecating, silly, quick jokes, um, um, observations. Yeah, he's big. Funny yeah, and that dude, that dude can stretch a topics for so long with random lines, and then he'll trail off. But he's got that, 
He's got the audience voice that has made him Hot Pockets. very yeah. This yeah. guy's terrible. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, that, he's that just voice. that voice makes me start laughing. You know, yeah, like and that that funny. had to have been. I, I don't know. I I assume it started all an accident. We're a set at a club late, probably a late show, wasn't going great, and he probably was just doing that just to go. All right, how do I get out of this? This guy's terrible. He's so pale. I assume that's where it came from. Right, the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know. Yeah, he's that's like, cool. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say what the audience is thinking, but there's only one Gaffigan, and the more I do this, I don't know. I just I like telling jokes. There's people that try to go, hey, you know, we don't know who you are. Be you. I'm like, I'm a I'm a simple dude who tells jokes. And then I started hearing Jay Leno. I saw Jay Leno uh, two years ago. Mm-hmm. That was phenomenal, a legend. And he is a he's just a rapid fire joke teller, and I love his approach. I love his work ethic. He because he talks more on these podcasts now. He talks about how he always saved with one comedy gig, spent with the other, never spent a Tonight Show money. His work ethic's just really simple and straightforward, but he's just a, a simple joke guy. And uh, the more I do this, I'm like, I like, I mean, I'll tell stories, but the stories need to have a punchline every couple of seconds. You don't, you don't want to lose the audience. So you don't want to get them too old. I mean, if you have them old, you want the payoff to be worth it. But yeah, the more I do this, I just think of uh, jokes that make sense coming from me, but are quick. Like that Aldi joke is a new one where I'm like, all right, that's two to three, maybe two sentences in, and then I get a punchline. So, and the crowd laughs big. And so, all right, next joke. Yeah. Um, Anthony Jezel next that way. I mean, but after a while, you realize, oh, this is a sadistic, sick individual but he's awesome so have you heard anthony jeselnik i have yeah he's awesome oh he's he is such an assassin on he's he's like a mafia hitman on stage he's just cold so you know cold. no remorse yeah yeah he says, like, says the worst thing possible yeah and, and doesn't it's care shocking, and it's great yeah like, that's it's, what it's he's supposed spirit, to say it's the spirit of norm mcdonald is still alive which is what i love so <laughs> Uh, that was another hero that I'm like, I can't believe that guy. And he, he didn't tell anybody he had cancer. Um, he he was so against the grain and it worked in his favor every time. I Yeah. That dude was that dude was the nicest guy apparently, but fearless. Absolutely fearless. Did not care what platform he was on, he was gonna he was gonna shock some people. I always loved seeing him on, <laughs> on late night shows. He, yes. he had the best stories and the best jokes and the weirdest <laughs> like what? what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. yeah. And he would say the weird thing, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah." Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like it's normal. <laughs> yeah. The the moth joke on Conan was fantastic. Yeah. You heard that? Story? Yes. The moth joke. Oh, it's so long, and just like what? It's, and that came from Conan O'Brien. He just wanted more time with Norm. He's like, "Hey, think of a story. Like, I need you for eight more minutes. I want you on this couch for eight more minutes. I need you to." Think of something. Oh, is that so, what, the, what? Yeah, that's that's cool. where that came from. And you met Conan. Yeah, Conan was awesome. He was so. He cool. is a he is a music lover, is he not? Like, he is. I, he, is. I, he gets up yeah. and jams the guitar. And he, right. He likes to be in the band. And um, yeah, yeah. So when we played, he came up and he was asking about, you know, Tom's guitar. He's like, hey, what is that? Oh. You know, and you know, it, it was cool. He was really nice. Got to shake his hand and and talk to him for a few. Yeah, I was. Great experience. Uh, I can imagine. Like, I just, I love how deep he is into music. Like, I, Big Sandy and the Fly Rap, or Big Sandy was on the oh, podcast, yeah. which uh, you, you helped spawn the podcast, by the way. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. We, uh, we, yeah. we're kind of talking about that right before we started the, the podcast. But, um, yeah, but Big what, Sandy was on it, and he, uh, I didn't realize he was on Conan until after he was on the podcast. And I'm like, man, Conan really is big into like, you don't have to have a huge hit on the radio. If he likes you, knows about you he's gonna have you on a show yeah i mean big sandy and the fly right boys are one of my favorites by the way so i was good. uh i was pretty blown away that you, you had them on the show because i was like what really i, I yeah. met sandy he doesn't know i don't think he knows who i am like i didn't like hey i'm my Herrera. <laughs> what's up yeah uh, but i just like went to a show years ago got a record signed by him uh cool. yeah just been a big fan you know rockabilly style i love that it's texas oh. swing yeah, yeah. I'm gonna so good. Um, there's another one I just recently discovered. They don't. I mean, they were back in the '50s. Uh, Sid King and the Five Strings. I'll, I'll send you some of their stuff if you don't know them already. But 
Yeah, if you like Big Sandy, you would like them. They're, they were like a Texas troubadour rockabilly swing style. But yeah, rockabilly, I got, I mean, I liked it before, but I really got into it in 2020. And that's when I started picking up the guitar more. Like, you, I got my favorite bands, and then there's guitar players I just have always looked up to. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian Setzer was one of those. I just didn't think I had the patience or skill to sit down, learn his licks, because he's so versatile. People, he gets, He doesn't get enough attention on great guitar players it always goes to like hendrix who was great but i'm like dude setzer tears it up like setzer is and he, amazing yeah i've seen him he, live a couple so, times did you see a solo or did you just get to see the, the uh, stray cats? I, solo uh where he oh, had, okay. yeah he he does all these different um instruments and it's pretty amazing yeah he can tear up a banjo like yeah. too yeah i saw him like a uh, small band solo solo meaning like just like a punk style like three or four people yep. and then and then I saw him with the big band as well, which he was mm-hmm. doing for a while, and that was insane too. The orchestra, yeah, so good, the, yeah, and it was Brian groundbreaking. He, that's a guy when you hear his backstory, is really insp- him and Dwight Yoakam are really inspiring to me. I know they don't do comedy, but Stutzer's like, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to almost go broke doing this orchestra. I believe in it. I'm going to go after it, and that's what he did. And it, it, it and that. First album wasn't a success. I think it was the second album that had Jump Jive, and that's what launched everything uh, with the orchestra. He re- he reinvented himself, and it was awesome. Dwight Yoakam tried the Nashville thing, and it was like, nope. So he said, screw this. Went to L.A., did his music in L.A. at punk rock clubs, which I can't – that those two don't go together in my head, but he did it, owned it, and it worked out pretty well for him. And uh, just – creating your own path it's it's cool to see guys go after that and, and it work out for them so those two guys are you know inspiring in a lot of ways and that's definitely one of them their yeah. their work ethic so i love dwight yokum i mean he's, he's so good my favorite country artist is dwight, or one of my favorite artists is dwight and uh great actor. amazing act yeah so good yeah Swing <laughs> <James. played>. oh <laughs> like i that's one of my favorite movies and I just grow up like I knew I knew stepdads or I knew stepdads in the South that reminded me of that. I was like, he plays his parts. You get you get so angry watching them. I'm like, he's so good at this. And that's what you're supposed to do as an actor. Get that get that genuine reaction. Not, you know, not. A, oh, I appreciated the art form, but the oh, I, I hope he dies at the end of this. You know, that's almost how you want to treat that bad guy. Right. That's what, right. They're supposed to get that reaction from you. Absolutely. Make you mad. Yeah. Make you mad. Yep. Good art makes you mad sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pro that's pro wrestling too, man. That's what they, that's the old school pro wrestling. You're, when you, when people believed it, you're like, I can't believe that guy said that about the, my hometown and old wrestling. I'm, I'm, I'm so scatterbrained. Sorry, but old wrestling, old school mm-hmm. wrestling, they really thought it was real to the point where if they didn't like that bad guy, they knew where their car was after the match like wrestlers would go up to their car and find windows broken, tires slashed. Like, wow, that's 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 art. Getting that genuine, I believe what's going on reaction, that authenticity. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you play the heel. Do you ever play the heel on the, <laughs> on stage with comedy? I have a few times. Uh, it's an old. So you talked about jokes. I will bring old jokes back, and I have a joke about like a car that had a French name. I, it's it's a silly joke, but I I do it intentionally to get a, like a, a groan or a oh my gosh. I talk about how it was how I treated it. It was a French name, and I treated it like it was French. I never washed it. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'll be like, I did it in Munster, Indiana, just to name a town. And the crowd goes, oh, man. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Big French population here in Munster, Indiana. And they laugh at that. So I'll I'll do a quick line to get, you know, to get that reaction, which is good. That means they're all listening to you. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, yeah. yeah and you yeah, can, if you if you can diffuse it, that's that's where the joke comes in. You're diffusing that situation, too. So. And I, yeah, like I make myself the butt of jokes where I talk about how I got mad at these protesters down the road at my house. I rolled down the window. I started yelling at them, telling them to go home. No one cares. And then I found out later it was a car wash or a fundraiser. Mm. <laughs> so, so everybody grows. You know, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm making myself the bad guy and the butt of the joke all in one right there too. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you kind of just get 
ideas from just driving around town. Like you see something like that and you're like, Oh yeah. That's Cause a I re- joke. or that was a, that was a real thought where I, I remember driving down the road in my town and I saw teenagers with signs and I, it was right around 2021. And I'm like, Oh, I remember going, I'm sick of this protesting everything. I'm sick of it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got closer and I realized, Oh, it's a car wash. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it is protesting the cars being dirty. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Clean cars but I had, now. Clean car. Right. <laughs> I'm sick of this. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So those real things. And because uh, you, when you first start in this comedy, you, you, you're like, I need content. I got to write. I got to write. Mm-hmm. But the more you do it, you're comfortable on stage. We're like, all right, I will tell a story. And I, I feel good about where this is going to go. I'm confident enough. That confidence is key. And that's, I'm still figuring out the more when I'm headlining these shows, I'm just like, all right. Hey, they've never heard this joke. Step into it. Like have have some bass into into the microphone. Like say it with your chest. Don't be timid. Yeah. Act like this. Don't don't. And that's the other thing. A lot a new joke. A lot of comedians do this. We'll dance around the topic before instead of just going into it. Mm-hmm. And if you dance around it, the audience, the subconscious, they're they're gonna feel that. They're like, why is he hesitant? To, why is he why is he dodge? Why is he why is he why is he being cautious? Like, they'll. They're not saying that, but that is the feel. And if you just get into it and without them thinking about it, because you can't think too much. Thought is the enemy of, of comedy or co- thought is the enemy of, of a punchline yeah. sometimes. What, how, do you, how do you decide what's what a story that's worth telling? And, then, and not all stories are necessarily funny all the mm-hmm. time. So are you are – you, do you have to – actually like have the story okay this happened to me but then do you write a joke to go on the end like here's the big payoff you have to kind of write what you say so that it comes out in a funny way even if it's a true thing it might be you know you say it in a way that you wouldn't have said it at the time or or whatever yeah do you do you do little bits throughout the 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 story as well where you have to write or do you just kind of talk and kind of like the funny the situation is funny and you let that be humorous or sure is the story meant to hook you into because humans love stories right they love stories but there's got to be a they got to want to know what's happening like what's happening mm-hmm. and what's going to happen at the end and and so if it's funny at the end then it's like you know the payoff is there if it's, oh, yeah. if it's surprising at the end the payoff is there mm-hmm. if it's you know whatever it's got to be a few things right I, i'm not a philosopher so I don't know which <laughs> which all the things are, but but it's definitely a payoff would be a funny payoff, uh, a, a surprised, uh, exciting payoff, you know. Yeah. Um. But do you? Does it? I mean, does that come naturally to you, or is that something you have to like? Okay, you think about this is part of the the the, the work that I got to do as a comedian. Put this together. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's always there's naturals at comedy, and we hate those people because uh, <laughs> like they're just good, like Sinbad was good and likable. I mean, obviously he honed his craft, but that's a guy that was everything he said right. was gold, like on and off stage, right? Like, yeah, he doesn't. He just gets on the stage and is like, oh man, that's a weird shirt, and just the way like I'm gonna wear this tonight. Like he'll just do that, and it's awesome. The crowd loves him right away, and that's just that's a natural. Um, I I've. I like to say that I've had to work really hard to be average at this. So, um, yeah. So the storytelling is, uh, I've had to figure that out cause I've like, it's scary. I'm all right. This isn't a joke. There's some vulnerability here. This, if you don't want to confuse the crowd, they want you to do well. And so just tell the story as honest as you can. That's a Nate Bargatze thing. You told me that once, just tell a story as true as you can. And you know, if you need to tweak it, sure, but tell the story because jokes are reactions. Like you can tell these, like, and you feel it. I mean, you're a songwriter. You perform. You you know, there's a feel of where to take things, where to. And that's the side side topic. That's one reason I love your guys' songwriting so much is that it's purposeful and it takes you places. It it keeps your interest, and that's what you got to do with storytelling. You got to tell it, and then based if the crowds all react in the same way at one word you're saying or one phrase you're saying then you know all right i can this might be a good spot for a punchline this might be a good spot for a reaction 
And sometimes that real reaction is going to be fine. Other times you're like, okay, treat it like a pop song. I need, I need a hook right here Mm -hmm. to get this big reaction. Um, the, the real, the realest story I tell on stage is how I close it. And, uh, I did, this was after we met and I did Waco. I was, uh, on the Mike Huckabee show and they film it here in Tennessee. And I, uh, did my jokes and then, I leave and I, and I'm in the green room and I realized my zipper was down mm-hmm. <laughs> down. And my mom's in the crowd. My friends are in the crowd. My mom is like losing it, gripping everybody. She can to like, just, you know, I can't believe it. How, how do we tell them? How do we tell them? Luckily it wasn't live. They air it the next day, but I was mortified, but you know, and I told the producer like, Hey, I might be the first comedian band on your, uh, your Christian TV show here. And, uh, you know, she was like, oh, we saw it. You'll be good. Luckily, I was wearing black jeans. They fix it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's not live. And I did throw those jeans away that night. I know that. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, see you, Levi's. And uh, I started telling that story on stage. And people were laughing already just at me telling it as is. But I needed a way to close it. So I added some things that, you know, didn't happen. Things that, like I'm the butt of the joke at the end of the, of that story. And so I set my, like my dad up in that story to make me the butt of the joke. Like I make my dad the hero in that whole story, honestly. And so, uh, yeah. So you tell a story as real as you can, see what you can get. And if you're like, all right, if I phrase this here, the crowd will probably understand it better. Less words, the better. Don't want to, you don't want to burn those, uh, brain calories. So, uh, so yeah, that's, yeah, um, Titus does a really good job at, the, at his approach to story because he's he's all storytelling. Christopher Titus, he says he writes one line on a paper, leaves a blank space, writes another line, and he leaves those open spaces for a reaction. So, okay, yeah, interesting. So yeah. when you're okay, so when I imagine you're you put your set list together, you might have like, you know, I don't know. Paper bunny, whatever, whatever you call yeah. something is like some, you have like names for your joke for your bits, kind yeah, of yeah, like a song, like a song title, like a song like, title. Yeah. So you have yeah. that, and then you have inside the set list. You don't have this written down, maybe, but you just know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and this, and then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to talk about this and see how it goes. Yeah. That's what I think will be funny. If it doesn't work out. I tweak, I change, yeah. I do something. Else. I mean, we kind of do that with like musically because we have a lot of transitions that we do, things that aren't part of just the song itself. They're in between the songs. We do like an intro. And so like sometimes that goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And you have an idea mm-hmm. in your head. You're like, this is going to be great. The crowd's going to love it. Yeah. And then nobody reacts and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to try something else. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. do, you, do, you guys, do you guys act like it didn't happen or do you have to go, all right, well that went well. Or do you do you guys acknowledge it if it if it doesn't go the way you thought? No, because it's it's a set, so we're just moving. So it's just okay. moving on, and and it's yeah. Oh, they didn't react to that, but they'll react to this next thing. Or, or okay, whatever, but, yeah, I, but, I, uh, I do the same. Well, if it's if it's a new idea, I I try to say, I don't introduce it as hey, you guys want to hear a new joke? Sometimes I've, I used to do that, but I feel like it's better to just no. act like you've been telling it forever yeah and so you just you sneak it in there and you know and if it doesn't work then you can be like because it's okay to address it once but if you do it over and over again you know maybe you suck so uh you just go all right well that's a new joke i'll never do that again and if you address that obvious the crowd will like that or if you're sometimes a joke won't land and i'll be like imagine having to hear that and it not go well guys I had to tell it to you and it not go well so <laughs> you know I'm in a way worse spot than you I had to tell it you guys had to sit through watching it like you guys can leave I can't I just hammer on that for a minute but or even really you can just all right quiet reaction next joke don't even don't forget about it yeah just go to your next topic that that's a thing still you never quite figure this out but that's definitely something I'm learning. And it, again, it's just confidence being on stage. And so the shows I was doing last year just definitely helped with that. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm in charge. I can, I can hang. And you're thankful for those crappy experiences in the past. Cause it, it, it can make you bulletproof while you're up there. You're like, all right, 
I've learned in my ten years of doing this, no no one died if if this didn't go well. So yeah, yeah, you know? totally. I mean, that is such a, a wise thing to say because there's so many people that are just pe- petrified of of moving forward, of committing to something, of being in charge of something, of of making that decision. Right, that decision is so hard for people and it's hard for me too i mean i'm not saying that i'm outside this i mean we're all part of this at times right and if you can get a get that victory of 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 having some failures and living through that that's like to me that's success living through your failures right don't you mean don't fear a little failure don't fear yeah yeah yeah, sorry (laughs) sorry i had to fanboy one time like i had to Sorry, I, and I was so worried you wouldn't have me on the ep- podcast again after 2020 because I, I listened to that episode back, and I'm like, holy crap, this is a Chris Farley show. Lee is doing the Chris Farley show from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I was, I remember just like, remember that one remember that album, Mike? Remember that? That was awesome. I felt that way <laughs> after, after listening to it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. So, so let so. me ask you this. Do you listen to your show tape? Do you listen back to your comedy and make I, notes? Video is more helpful, and I've been I've I've been blessed with some uh, comedians who ha- who who bring a lot of who bring certain video equipment with them, and they'll film my set for me too. Um, so I've been watching more video, and it's almost better to watch video on mute because body language is is huge. Mm-hmm. And the more I watch, I'm going, I'm still doing that after ten years, or oh, why am I? You just moving is so intentional on stage, and I'm just like, man, should I? not move as much and you know but the shows are going well so you're just like well they don't they didn't hate it but i I watch that and go all right it's it's game film you know players watch game film and they go all right i need to work on this so i watch it more what's up i just was thinking about what you said i was just thinking like i don't when i watch myself i don't think I could do better, but the crowd really liked it, so I should probably yeah. just keep doing that. You know, like right. I don't think that ever. I think no, I'm gonna get better at this, even if I yes. don't actually get better. Sure. In my mind, I want to get better, and that yeah. drives drives it for. I just had to point that out. Sorry. Yeah. Like, but they liked it, so. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, uh, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I say so many things wrong all the time, and. Uh, yeah, so that's what I do watch. I do watch on mute, and I'm going. Okay, I'm like the most recent show I watched, where I thought because there's that's been there's been so many times like that where the show is like, oh, that felt really good, like the crowd was into it, but then you watch the video back, and you're like, it seems quiet. I thought they reacted bigger than than that. So that that happens often. And you're like, okay, how do I how do I fix that? So how do I fix that perception reality? I mean, with the camera in the back and it just caught the laughs for back yeah. that way as opposed to being in front. So What I've found is, even in our experience, when you're in the moment, everybody's having such a good time. And to make – but it's really hard to show that on video. It's really hard to capture that. Mm-hmm. And you do sometimes, but, you know, just having a video camera isn't always – doesn't do it, you know. Right, um, right. Yeah, you got you to gotta, you gotta, – yeah, you got, you got to separate the two. Yeah, it is different. So it's hard. It's so for me, I go okay. So I want to be good at both moments. I want to be good in the moment, and I want to be good after the fact on video. So like, what do yeah. I need to do to to make that happen? And and there's some things you can do as a performer for sure. Yeah, comedian. And, it's obviously a little different, you know. But yeah, but it's as as a performer, you're yeah. like you you see th- you don't see things the same way an audience is going to see them. Right, you're picking out when you watch yourself back. You're noticing things that bug you a lot. Yeah, right. Like you're just like, yeah. Oh, why did I say yeah. it that way? Like I yeah. I say that to myself. Like why did I sing it like that? Oh, I mean, I know why I sound like that. I, yeah, like, and then you got you got <laughs> I'm done. You've got you've got live. <laughs> no, you've got live albums. I'm sure you go back and go. Do you, do you are you like oh okay? Do you, do you question things you said on? When you're between songs or doing sometimes, transitions, sometimes okay. it's like oh, I ruined that one. I shouldn't have talked there. It, you know, sometimes yeah. you just need space, and and in the moment you don't, you're not thinking that. You're thinking, I'm with you. I'm gonna re- interact with you. 
But yep. and when people are watching back, they don't need that interaction. They just need the the song and the performance. <laughs> Absolutely. So it is yep. a little different. And so like there's yep. a happy medium there, I think, where yep. you can have interaction, but it doesn't necessarily have to like take over the whole set or the whole show. Yeah. I'm learning the best reaction on how to separate the video between a live performance is how the crowd feels after. Um, if they're like, oh, we loved it. We want to have them back. Oh, man, you were here last year. We loved it. That's a better tell than anything else, um, honestly, because uh, you, you, if you had a show that went really well, they don't hear, you don't hear back from people or like the, the showrunners. You're like, oh, what happened? But when people are talking about it afterwards or telling their friends afterwards or they're emailing the venue saying, oh, man, we had a great time when he was there. Those are better tells. If you leave a good impression, mm -hmm. then, you know, because I've I've been a part of the other situations like that, too. And that's also why I don't. Early on, I never was going to say I killed. That's a lot of comedians have that, and I'm not disparaging that. Just personally, when I would other hear comedians say, "Oh, I did the show last night, I killed," and I just never set well with me. So I'm always like, I'll ha I'll say I have fun, and I'll say I've had more fun than that show or this show or this one was really fun. But to say I killed has never set well with me. If I'll let other people decide that, it's like being the toughest guy in the room. Like, let other people speak for you. You don't. Don't, you don't need to praise yourself. Let other people do that on your behalf. Like, because there's been times there's been comedians that said they killed, and we're all looking around like, uh, were, were we at the same show? Like, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, awareness. You got to have awareness to uh, to do this. You, you know, don't be, don't attack yourself, and don't destroy yourself if the set doesn't go well. But. You have to have awareness. You don't 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 beat yourself up, but you got to have awareness and honesty. Going, yeah. all right, this didn't go well. How do I how do I change that? Yeah. Excuse me. I think what you what you do is you have a mix of one of the oldest professions in the world, which is performance, uh, public performance, comedy, or you know, being a public orator, speaking, public speaker. And then, of course, the the modern modernity, however you say that, of the technology and social media world, the marketing, people seeing you from all over the world, having maybe it's hard to have a context of where you fit in in the world when you're doing something as old as time, mixed with something that's like brand new, and um, yeah. you're expected to be all things, you know, funny, funny, funny. Yeah. Booker marketing. It's yeah. just this like smashing of both worlds together. And, and yeah. that's, uh, you know, I think MXPX and what I do with music has been the same thing. You know, we've been yeah. dealing with, you know, we we're performers, you know, yeah. I can get a kazoo and make a song out of it, or I can, you know, do an MXPX show with all the lights and the, the loud noise. So anyway, yeah. back to, to comedy and what you do. How does how do you feel about that mix of of those two worlds? Of uh, of, of of the art form, or like the or, or the, of the, the sort of like the the simpleness of like this is literally my job is to speak, my job is okay. to tell stories. Yeah, that's as old as time, but it's also sure. to learn to do it with all these modern ways, modern technology oh yeah um do, does that sit well with you do you are you good at at being on your phone because there's a lot of comedians that are just pros at doing the the promotion on their phone and all of yeah. that yeah like where do I've, you sit in that spectrum of, of of all these things like what are you spending your most time on throughout the right day? I'm, I'm i'm better at it uh, than i used to be like a year and a half ago um with social media like yeah the this thing has been around for a long time, comedy, and it's adapted. Like it used to be one-liners, Henny Youngman, and you know stuff like that. But it's it adapted. I mean, Carlin and Pryor changed the game in the '70s, or there's other comedians did too. But those are like those are bigger names. It changed in the '80s. Seinfeld created this act that got parodied. Um, then you had the alternative comedians: Pat Oswalt, Brian Bussain, and uh, Janine Garofalo. Who she's a huge punk rock fan, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. I think I've heard that back in the day. She's uh, yeah. she's hung out with Henry Rollins a few times. We we were at, we were backstage one night at Zany's. She was doing a comedy fest. I was just hanging out, and she was so cool. And we were just we were talking about yeah Henry Rollins, and she 
done awesome. had done perform performances with them, and yeah. I was like, man, she's really cool. Um, so it's all so comedy's always adapted, but funny is funny, and if you can get a general crowd to laugh at, you know, your jokes, you're doing great. Um, I love the profession. It's um, there's definitely times I wanted to hang it up because it was so difficult, but the next gig came and it was a good show, and you're like, okay, I know I can do this because I'm looking at the past. All right. It's within me to keep doing this. Um, yeah, I, I did. As far as making it a job, it's the best job ever. Um, I've had I've had a lot of crappy jobs. I talk about those jobs on stage, and so I would take this. <laughs> I would take this. I would take this over any of those jobs still. Um, but the I've I've had to learn to adapt with uh, social media. I've it's tough because I'll put comedy clips on there, and they just get. I don't get a lot of traction. I've tried doing selfie videos with a quick joke. It just some people it takes off. I don't know what I'm doing that's not quite there yet. But the promotion I've learned how to promote. I've had some good mentors who talk about the art of a paid promotion. I've had some people who do this for a living, gave me some really good insight on how to promote. And I've done really well. I, I promise all these venues that I'm gonna be professional and that I'm gonna promote my tail off. And uh, I hope they do the same. It's kind of how I yeah. approach it. And do you, so, do you set and like set and set the ads yourself? Like, I have. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'd be awesome if I could afford someone for someone else to do that. But I've had to learn to uh, create ads from business manager. And one point it was simple, and I had it down to an art form. Like I was finally all right. I had a fifteen second ad. It's going to tell them what they need to hear. It's going to yeah. get their interest. Crowd shots. Like this could be you. Learning so much from uh, Donald Miller. He did this uh, story brand book, and he talks about making the audience the hero. Um, you're their guide, kind of like they're they're Marty McFly, you're Doc Brown. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's and it makes sense. He's like, don't make yourself the focus. Make it about them. What you know, they're the hero in this thing you're selling or pitching to them. So I was figuring that out. Facebook changes its its deal. It doesn't work like it used to. So I've had to get coached a little bit, and it's it's like detonating a bomb now on Facebook Manager. You're just picking each little thing, and you know if you pick one thing that could put you in the wrong category, and you don't get what you want when you're putting in your goals on those Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. So I've learned it because I've had to. I, I would much rather someone else do that, but um, you know I've had I've had to be a DIY about the whole thing, and uh, it makes me appreciate it a lot more. I know that. So I mean. Honestly, like people listening, this is you're doing what you really should be doing at the very least on the business end, doing it yourself because you have to like a lot. of Most people would just not do that. They would just go, you know what? I tried comedy. It was it was like, you know, it wasn't fair or whatever. I couldn't, yeah. you know, they make up an excuse, but it's like it is hard to do anything and gosh, you know, comedy, you're by yourself. You're you. So if they don't like yep. you, it's just you. I mean, if they don't like MXPX, maybe they don't like the drumming. I doubt it. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's my fault. But, but it's like, you know, I could tell myself, like, somebody else pulled the trigger. It wasn't me on the firing squad. No, but th those fans are still ticked about Andy, the first guitar player. Yeah, like, yeah. Who like, won what? Andy? <laughs> yeah. Andy's he's doing all right. But, uh, <laughs> dude, this has been really good. Like, honestly, Without going in super depth into like, okay, so how, what do you click on that ad or whatever? But yeah. just hearing that you're actually setting and running ads, you're yeah. promoting, you're bombing on stage, you're learning from it, you're like, okay, what do I do next? You're like, a, you're like all of us, but you're actually in the thing, you're doing it. And what we hear online all day, every day, is you could be making $30,000 <laughs> a month or whatever, like, for just sitting on your ass watching YouTube videos or whatever, <laughs> or, or affiliate marketing or all this and that. And it's just like, that, yeah, that, no, no, nobody's making that money. Like some, no. a few people maybe, but it's all like right. a pyramid scheme. It's all like a scam somehow. I, I, I know it sounds good and we get so worked up over like life should be easier and it should be. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, but my wife and I were talking about this earlier and we're like, we, I think life was easy when we were younger. I mean, it was simple. <laughs> it was, you know, it's just like, that's <laughs> when we had an easy life, but now times have changed and it's just going to be work and more work. And, yeah. and, and yeah, there's a few lucky people that 
don't have to work, but everybody yeah. else is going to have to work. There's, um, we're meant to work, man. Um, Andy Kaufman, yeah. when he was when he was at the peak of taxi fame, it could have been just a joke, but he did it anyway. It didn't matter. He was busting tables at, at a restaurant in L.A. He was probably doing it as a deep, deep joke, but <laughs> but uh, he he always wanted to like say something more than just being yeah. funny, right? Like there was always yeah. something deeper. And I'm not a huge fan of Andy Kaufman. I respect sure. I respect so I liked, him. In I some like ways, Taxi, but you know, <laughs> Taxi. I like that, outside of that. Yeah, no. Outside of Taxi, I'm like, what? What happened to just being funny? Like, what? Like, why can't you just be funny on stage? Why yeah. is this? Why do you like? I love Bill. H- I love Bill Hicks. His early comedy stuff when he was a teenager. He was like he was a, he be, he was always good, but when he was a teenager, he was a monster early on. He had some really good you know, old school jokes. He was funny. Then he got really deep and, you know, wanted to change. I don't know if he wanted to change the world, but he wanted to like give some more opinions on, on the state of the world. And he's a super smart guy. Hats off to him. But yeah, there hit a point where I'm just like, man, what happened to just being funny? There's people that want to come escape when they come see a comedy show. Like, yeah, there's just, different types. There's different types. You know, yeah. there's all these like sort of like woke comedy too, and some people love that, right? So, so there's all types of comedy, and there's all types of of people that that some people want to hear the commentary on social social whatever situations, yeah, politics, whatever. Like Bill Maher, you know, he's going to talk about some social and, and political issues, yeah, but. Jim Gaffigan, yeah, you know, you can talk about some hot pockets, some workplace yeah. <laughs> funny things, subway, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you know, so it's like we all I think we need it all, right? But when you are when you're an artist and you're doing shows and shows and shows, I don't know Bill Hicks. I don't even know his comedy that well to be honest. So I'm just kind of speaking more broadly. But I I could imagine and and as as I go through changes, I'll come back to those one-liners, like a real fast punk song that's short. Yeah. You know, that that to me, kind of like a one-liner punk song. I don't want to do only one-liner punk songs, you know? So so I imagine that's what Bill was probably thinking, you know? And yeah. he, he probably had a shift in his fan base, right? Like his fan base went, I like the one-liners to, yeah. I want something heavy and political and deep right. thinking. and. Um, yeah, that's um, there's a there's a lot of good documentaries on on the evolution of uh, Bill Hicks. Now, Bill Hicks, he, he did pass away of cancer uh, a few years ago. But there's a lot of good documentaries on on that. And it, yeah, there was there's some risk like George Carlin was even that way, too. He was a suit wearing clean cut. I'm on Ed Sullivan, t- you know, comedian, but grew his hair out, started making opinions that weren't popular Mm-hmm. And uh, being more George himself, Carlin. I love phenomenal. George. I and think he, he got yeah, he's so good. He got better with age too. I mean, mm-hmm. his last special was my favorite one. So yeah, so. I just I love it when comedy is funny for one. You know, so I, I love all types of comedy. It doesn't matter almost what even the topic is, as long as I'm laughing. And then two, I I do like a George Carlin, somebody that sees the world in a in a more individual way, um, somebody that's a little bit of an outsider, I, I definitely connect to that kind of person. Even though I'm, I wouldn't say, like, if I did comedy, I don't know what kind of comedian I would be, right? Like, what I would probably tell stories or whatever, but, like, I, I have no idea. I mean, there's no hope for me in that regard. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I, I would have to, it would have to come somewhat natural um just because it seems like so much work to be fake right as a comedian right like yeah um you have like um there's some comedians that have that have ended up being their character right uh what's his mm-hmm. name uh you know not jeff jeff foxworthy but uh larry the cable guy larry the cable guy like he started yeah, dan, out that was a dan whitney dan whitney yeah he started out yep. as a as just a it was a character of his yeah and then, he would call in radio shows and, and do that voice, and the crowd would ask for where the they would it was like song yeah. requests. They were asking, they were asking for it. To me, that's like Kiss doing makeup, like that. The, when they do makeup, they're popular. When they don't do makeup, people are like, ah, no, oh, I don't want. It. I mean, 
Look it up was a cool song, but man, put on that makeup. So, <laughs> put on that makeup. <laughs> put, on, uh. put on that makeup, you wuss. Um, <laughs> did you ever see that? Did you see the movie about Kiss, Detroit Rock City? Oh yeah, of course. Such a Love good it. rock and roll movie. So great, man. So funny. That was Love such it. a fun movie. I've seen most of the rock and roll movies, um, as far as I know. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. Even even uh, the bad ones, like Rockstar. Did you see Rockstar? Oh, with, that is uh, a bad one. Is it, yeah. is it uh, These, Mark Wahlberg? Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, These are my cables, and I'm taking them. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, who made this? Is so funny. But it was also kind of. <laughs> I was kind of into it. I was like, I still well, watched it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still finished it. Yeah, yeah. And you're going. Wait, this is the story, and it, they, that's what they. That's where it came from. It was based on the new frontman for Judas Priest. Okay. Did, was, was, go ahead. No, he was the guy was working at it. He was working at a copier store, and he someone found a video of him because he, he was in a tribute band for Judas Priest. They got it to the right guys, and he was their singer after after Rob after Rob left. So, dude, that's wild. That's yeah, where they came that, from. was Jennifer Aniston in that movie? She sure was. Okay. Yep. That's yeah. right. I, I'm, it's all coming back to me. They're backstage. It's like, that's what it looked like at the Palladium. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, of course, the most quotable one's got to be That Thing You Do. So Love that movie. Yeah, That Thing You yeah. Do. TV player. And, yeah. Did you? When I was a kid, I was learning bass, and I was just going, they didn't give him a name. I didn't realize it was a joke. It's a joke, yeah. I, I was insulted. I'm like, why didn't they? Doesn't the bass player have a name? Because <laughs> at the end, end credits, I'm going to find out his name. TV player, son of a gun. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is that is great. I I definitely yeah. noticed that as a bass player. <laughs> All right. The, the attention to detail with that thing you do. Yeah. You can tell the quality. They they sounded like a garage band at the beginning. I love that they, there are so many rock and roll movies where they sound phenomenal. Like yeah. uh, La Bamba was that way. He sounded the same no matter what setting he was in. But you saw the adaptation in that movie. That's just good continuity and good direction. They're like, mm. we're going to make them sound more polished as the movie yeah, as the movie as goes they on. Get, get so more reps and the the gear's going to get nicer. They're not going to start out with a Rick and Bacher guitar. You know, it's going to be that silver uh, silver tone. Yeah, silver tone guitar. Sears and so, guitar, yeah, yeah, it's going to start up that way. I love that oh, small detail. I like that too. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because you're right. I didn't, I didn't really thought about that, but it was really, really well done, and 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 the story is just so great. And w there's always been so many st more modern type rock movies, right? Like of of rock stars being drunk and crazy, but like <laughs> getting to see this sort of clean cut '50s thing or whatever was was rad. Mm -hmm. And 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 like oh. you mentioned, La Bamba, that was literally one of my favorite movies growing up. Like I I Same. still love that movie. Um, yeah, and, and it's probably part of what made me romanticize being a musician so much is watching that right. movie going, I could do that too. Like, I, yeah. I kind of look like Richie Valens. So yeah, heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little better looking, but uh, slightly, yeah, a little yeah. thinner yeah. these days anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, to do. um, cause I, I've noticed the, Come on, he's dead. cause he's dead. <laughs> That's true. Uh, oh my gosh! <laughs> come on, man! I see. I'm not a comedian. Sorry. It's like no, no, you're good. <laughs> Comedians don't. We don't laugh like we used to. We, we got into it because we love comedy, and then we get into it. We see the strings on the puppets, and so we don't laugh like we used to. It's it's the it's the worst part about getting into comedy. You don't appreciate it the way you did when you first got into it because now you're like you're listening more intently. You're going. Oh, I see why that's funny instead of just laughing. So yeah, but then I think yeah. eventually you go long enough and you'll appreciate other things that you oh, couldn't yeah. appreciate. Yeah. So I mean, I know what you mean, and that—that's just I think that's the reality of anything. Anything, anytime you make your hobby your job, you're going to lose a little bit of the the fun part. Yeah, um, it's still fun to do, but then you also yeah. have to like associate all this other not fun. In some cases, some of the worst times of your life with also the fun thing <laughs> you know oh, like absolutely. oh my god when i like last year it was awesome and last year came from necessity and uh i i had some places where i, I would go to coos bay oregon and I sold 300 tickets awesome i went to written washington and maybe 50 tickets and you're just going i gotta have fun these people bought a ticket but holy crap i am i'm livid right now that this venue didn't promote like I expected them to, or yeah, you're just kind of yeah. you're living. And then you're just 
Yeah. And then you have to like later on assess, okay, how do I, what do I have to do to get them to yeah. promote? You have to keep calling them. You have to email them, whatever. You have to like spend time, which is why it takes more than one person to do this. At Once you level up, you're just like, you can't do it all, when, you know? Right. Um, hey, Wayne's yeah. rule too. You, you can't run a concert alone. So <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So. <laughs> well, man, dude, so what do you got coming up and how can people find you? Yeah. Um, Lee Harden comedy.com is going to have all the social media on there and that'll be the quickest way to get to me. Lee Harden comedy.com. It's got clips, show dates. Um, and let's see what's next. Just doing the theater thing last year. Like it was a fluke. I, I thought I was never going to get to do the shows I got to do, like travel across the country, do these small theaters. It's such a, it's a unique experience and I want people to be a part of that experience. I do advertise my shows as clean comedy, because a lot of people like stand-up comedy but wouldn't step foot into a comedy club because they're afraid of what they might say. So I always push that even more than my name, that it's a clean comedy show. And uh, I want to keep that going. That's kind of what's next. Um, possible uh, acting roles, possibly. Um, I'm just – Again, it's it's an, it's like it's an opportunity right now, and I'm working on them. Uh, I, I'm treating it like buying a lottery ticket. I'm going to be ready, mm-hmm. but not expecting it. So there's some there were some movies I wanted to be in, and I'm currently reading a script to uh, prep for one of them. Hopefully that happens. Uh, it's a Hallmark movie. I uh, <laughs> dope. I mean, so, hey, I hope I, I mean get your foot in the door, man, because you just got to do a couple things, and then yeah, you know. So. And I'm not an actor, so I even I even found my old drama teacher from uh, from high school to help me read some lines. And so, uh, <laughs> like, a she's still in town. Is never done, right? <laughs> it's not. She's still in town, and I'm like, this is so random. But can you help me? And yeah, so I've been I've been working on that. Um, That's why you're going to succeed because you will you will humble yourself and go ask your your old high school teacher, drama teacher. From. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm cheap. And I'm just cheap. I don't want to pay for an acting coach. So, ah. you know. <laughs> no, but I, 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 genuinely, I really wanted to use her because I remember how she taught. And I'm like, oh, she actually didn't just do this. She, she lived and breathed this world. So I, I need her perspective on how to not sound like a radio DJ when I'm, when I'm reading lines. And, uh, you know, yeah. so that's – yeah, so hopefully that happens. I, I've, I've just always wanted to do those movies because uh, I think there's a fan base that would – come to come see my shows if i was in that in that world so of course um but yeah that'll be that'll be the next challenge and uh just keep writing and learning how to promote so those are the just stay working that's yeah. where that's where all of this came keep from just to stay working and uh you know by the way kick butt show at furnace fest i i was i was had such a good time oh, i saw you guys you. there yeah, even awesome. your sound check even your sound check by the way People were talking about it all day at the fest. It was, I've never heard anyone talk about a sound check. I was, I was really glad well, you hear the sound check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, that good. was, that was the rumor around 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 the around around Bama that day. That's so, awesome. Yeah, we had a great yeah. time. It was a great show, and and it was cool to headline Furnace Fest. Uh, it was our first and last time there because next year is their last year. Last one. So, I know. I don't think we're playing. So, um, but we had the best time. So thanks for checking that out, uh, dude Lee. Everybody, I, I just appreciate you being open, talking about some of the harder things. Uh, you know, everybody talks always about how it's going well, how it's, you know, all the, this is what I did that's so great. And yeah, that's always great to hear. And I love to hear that. But um, man, a lot of us are struggling. So it's great to hear that no matter, despite how hard it is, you just keep going, learn yeah. from it, pick yourself back up, wipe yourself and, off and, and, and move on. Adversity, this is not my phrase, but adversity will either destroy, develop you, or define you. And so, and if you're having adversity with whatever you're going after, um, I I try to combat it with thankfulness. There's a lot we have to be grateful for, like the small things, being able to wake up, being able to function, breathe, talk, smell, hear, like all these things, we, we, we overlook them all the time, so – be grateful for those things you do have because you're doing you, you're doing better than you think. So, absolutely, well said. All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Lee, for having me, Lee Harden Comedy, everyone. All right, thanks, man. Peace.